Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you who are on YouTube right now, um, I know it may look a little weird. I think the setup. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get it right, but it looks like I'm face too much down. Uh, yeah, it's not sitting up right, son. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll have to do that. Rotate lock is on. Can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> I usually just turn the rotator back off. It's on live right now, so. Oh, are you just gonna restart it? Huh? Are you just gonna restart it? Do you have to restart it to do that? Okay, well, it, I tried to sit it straight up and it wouldn't go straight up. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's just, it's however you start the video is how it's that, gonna, yeah, however you start the video is how it's gonna. Okay, so I, I, I won't be able to sit it any other way. Right, since you laid it down and you started it, it's gonna start, it, it's gonna only video lay down. Whereas if you start it standing up, then it's going to video standing up. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So um, um, you, could, you could stand it up. Uh, I tell you what. Let, let me uh, let me shut this down, YouTube, and I'm going to stand it up because it won't let me rotate the screen. Um, so just bear with us for a minute. Yeah, it's just something that YouTube has. It's really really stupid. Oh, it's trying to upload it. I don't need that. Okay. Let me shut this down. <laughs> hey, shalom, everybody. Almost done. All right, now, as you all can see, I have to have another phone sitting in the back. And uh, as always, I will take the best video and I will put that on. Um, I will make sure that I put that on. I'll save that one. So, do apologize uh, for the technical glitches but once again I did not get my stand this week <laughs> which I need to do so we'll, anyway we'll get started <laughs> forward uh, to talking about uh, speaking on this subject and let me be the first to tell you it is a very very delicate subject that we're getting ready to talk about and probably one of the toughest subjects for me so far because I have a lot of I don't I don't want to say that I'm scared but I think as somebody who 
gets up and speaks the word, there needs to be a righteous um, amount of reverency when it comes to Yah's word. And we never want to say anything wrong when it comes to Yah's word. We never want to make people believe something that should not be believed. And so, therefore, there has to be a fear when somebody speaks on the word, and especially when when people listen, there has to be a um, uh, a fear from a person who's speaking the Most High's word that they say it the correct way or that they do it um, the right way. So today is going to is um, the issue of once saved, always saved. Am I accountable for how I live? Um, let just let me go ahead and get started, and we'll. It's very hard uh, to do this, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started and just uh, give some information, and then we're gonna go into the scripture. I think it's very important that we understand that the scripture is the one who teaches, not men. It is the scripture who is the one that does the teaching. We may, I may come in behind and add some things. But ultimately, it's not the person who is speaking that is doing the teaching. It is the word that is being spoken that goes out that Yah says does not come back void. So let's look at what uh, Yah's word has to say about some of the, the issues that we're going to be talking about. Uh, just to give a little bit of history about where um, where this actually came from the whole doctrine of the once saved, um, always saved, um, we have to, we have to look at, at the origin of it, okay? Just know that this was never a doctrine amongst early Israel. It was never, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the blood Israel, and I'm talking about the engrafted who come in and are Israel. This was never, ever a doctrine. Nowhere do you find uh, once saved, always saved doctrine or justification by faith doctrine found anywhere at any time. It, it came up when John Calvin, who leads the Calvinist movement. And once again, here we go. We have a religion that is named after a man. The Calvinist movement, the people who say that they belong. Oh, well, what are you? Oh, I'm a Calvinist. You, you're already telling the people who you follow. So you're following a man. Okay, so John Calvinist, um, he, started the Cal he started Calvinism. And it started between, this doctrine actually came out between the 15 and the 1600s. And again, there's no document, documentation before John Calvin about once saved, always saved, or justification by faith only. So that, that, that's never been out. Um, this also originated, is the origin of the belief of um, false or true believers, or they say false or true Christians. So this, because of this, this actually came up as if a person doesn't make it to heaven, then they never was really a real Christian. Okay, they were a false Christian. Only the elect or only those who Yah chose before time, they were really the only ones who make it in. So um, if you're a true believer or a true Christian, as they say, you're the elect, you're the one um, who makes it in, you're never going to fall away. All right. And this is how it comes about. So this is more of an excuse that is used today, um, more of an excuse that is used today amongst people who follow Calvinism. If somebody, if you explain to them, well, you know, hey, these people lived in, in, and they walked according to the Most High 
for 50 years. And then the last years of their life, they decided to go into this religion, right? They decided to go into that religion, but they were, hey, man, they were laying hands on people and everything. And they decided to walk away. Then one would say, well, they never was really a true believer in the first place. That's where that comes from because they don't believe that a person can come into belief and then turn away. And we're going to look at the scriptures that have to do with that. There's so many scriptures to, to look at uh, regarding this subject and regarding this issue that I doubt today that we will cover them all. But what I am going to do is we're going to read some scripture um, that they use uh, to justify what they are saying. And then we're going to also read the other scripture. Um, we're just, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in just giving one set of scripture. We're going to look at both because all scripture is good. All of the writings are good. There's nothing bad. There'd be no reason to not want to read a certain thing because it may make people believe. No, all of it's good and we should go by all of it. Okay. Uh, today, big preachers like Charles Stanley. I don't know if any of you all know him, but I used to listen to him when I used to listen to the public, um, listen to radio when I lived in Louisville. Um, I used to listen to him when I'd be on the highway, driving up and down the highway back and forth. Charles Stanley, real profound, dominant teacher amongst evangelicals. Okay, and his thing is, is that you cannot lose your salvation. If you come, I, I posted a video up so you all can go back and read um, read this. And you can go back and listen to him on the video. I put it up on my page. He says that if you pray Jesus into your heart, basically, or come into belief, if you turn away and are not obedient, then you won't lose your salvation. You will lose your reward. Okay? So, in essence, you can come in and, and believe, and you can pray, as they say, pray Jesus into your heart, and then you're not basically accountable um, for how you live for salvation, okay? Um, according to Charles Stanley, who people, a lot of people listen to, especially a lot of Gentiles listen to, according to Charles Stanley, you will not lose your salvation. You will only lose your reward. So all of the things that you would have gotten when you was in heaven, you won't have in heaven. You'll just be there. Okay, so that, that's another um, justification by faith or once saved, always saved. And we have to compare what these people are saying to what, what Yah's word is saying. I never wanted to go to, well, I take that back. A, a long time ago, I wanted to go into the seminaries. I call them cemeteries. I wanted to go into the seminary uh, and I wanted to study and learn the scripture and everything. And I, it was just on my heart when it was time for me to do it. I didn't, for some reason, I chose not to do it. Because I was listening to the people tell me, hey, man, you go into them places, you come out more faithless when you come out than when you were when you went in. So I chose not to do it. Um, and then as I got a little older, I realized that I'm being taught what man is teaching. And they teach you how to dissect the Bible in such a way that you don't even believe it no more. So I stayed away from that, from that stuff. And so that's why I never went into it. Um, so I'm glad that I didn't as well. So now we have this thing of, uh, when it comes to scripture, there is uh, pre-scripture and there is uh, descripture or descriptive, prescriptive and descriptive scripture, okay? So prescriptures are the scriptures that are pre-prescribed by the Most High. Descriptive scripture or is scripture basically explaining or dissecting or, or just kind of explaining the scripture is something that comes off afterwards. So I'm going to give you this example. So if I give you an example of uh, David and, Go and Goliath or Dawid and Goliath, and we go through and read that, that whole little excerpt, excerpt about Dawid and Goliath. Okay, so somebody who says, okay, well, I'm going to use that. And he, once he start, uh, the person starts to see people um, going against the most high, they take a slingshot 
and go kill people. So they they basically have the way they've broken it down is these people have errored because they have taken uh, descriptive. They've taken scriptures and made it descriptive. So they took something that was described out of the scripture and they went and erred and used it in their own life in a way that it doesn't apply. This this is the unbelievable stuff that they that they like to to do with this. Prescriptive scripture is a scripture that the Most High speaks of. It's given a, a, a prescribed thing. And so we learn from that. So this is what they've done to the word. Instead of looking at the word and doing what the word says and saying what the word says, they break it down in such a way that it's, it's crazy and it plays mind games. And that's why people come out of uh, the seminaries with such low faith. It's because they broke broken Yah's word down so much they don't even believe it anymore. So let's go ahead and start looking at scriptures. We've got a bunch of scripture. I don't even, I don't think we're gonna be able to get through it all today. But let's go ahead and start looking um, at some of the scripture that, that we have. And I'm gonna start off um, talking about some some terms. Um, when we look at the word astray. You'll, you'll hear the word astray. Don't be led astray. Cat, don't be, don't go astray. The word astray means out of the right way or proper place. So if somebody goes astray, they go out of the right place or they go away from the proper place in which they are supposed to be. Okay. The word deceive, G41105. The Greek word G4105. It me deceive. It means um, I guess it's called pl planeo, which means to roam. It means to go astray. It means to error. It means to be out of the way. That's why they were called people of the way. It means to go to be out of the way, the way in which the Most High has given us. Okay, let's look at the word endure. G5278. G5278. It means to stay under. It means to remain. It means to preserve. It means to abide. It means to suffer. It means to tarry behind. That is the word that is written for endure. To stay under, remain, preserve, abide, suffer, or tarry behind. The Webster's 1828 uh, dictionary word is for endure means to last. To continue in the same state without perishing. To remain, to support without breaking or yielding to a force or pressure. I mean, we could almost close the book so far. But to last, continue in the same state without uh, perishing, to remain, to support without breaking or yielding to force or a pressure. So when we are in the truth, it's just like when Messiah talked about the seed along the path, and we're going to talk about those as well. Um, he is basically telling us to keep continue in the st same state without perishing. If we don't consider, if we don't stay in that same state, then we do perish. Okay. So you can start out in belief, but if you don't continue in belief, then you perish. Okay. So let's remember those, those, because these words are very important when it comes to, to the once saved, always saved doctrine. Once saved, always saved doctrines. These words cannot be accepted. They can't be used because it's a once saved, always saved. These say that you can go astray, that you can fall away, that you can move out of the way in which you were started out in. Okay? So these words say that. So this would not be um, good definitions or terms for a once saved, always saved doctrine. All right. So let's start looking at some passages. Let's look at some passages that are, that is used for 
the once saved, always saved um, doctrine. And all of these are good. They're for us. I'm not speaking against none of them because I will not speak against Yah's word. Okay? So if we're reading Yah's word and Yah's word says what it says, it says what it says. All I'm asking people to do is to take in the totality of what Yah's word is saying. So let's go to Romans chapter 8, 35. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Romans chapter 8. Verse, we're going to read verse 35 through 39. Romans chapter 8. Hockey Eugene, you want to read that? Sure. I think. 35 through 39. <laughs> yeah. 35 through 39. Who, who shall separate us from the love of Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Hamashiach, Messiah, our master. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful for that scripture. Because that scripture tells me that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of Messiah. There is nothing that can separate me from the Most High. Nothing. Satan can't take me away from the Most High. My job can't take me away from the Most High. Nothing can separate me from the Most High. He will not allow it to happen. Nothing can separate me from the Most High. Okay? That's a true verse. Believe it. Nothing, nothing can separate me from the Most High. Only me. Am I going to choose to follow? Am I going to choose to do what he says do after I come into belief? Am I going to be obedient and live according to how he calls me to live. But nothing can separate me from the most high. Okay? Let's let's make sure that we say that in the right way. Nothing, nobody can take me away from the most high. Nobody can. All right? So let's go to the next one. That's a good scripture. That's, that's a very good verse. And I can see where somebody can use that scripture and say, see, once I give my life to the most high, can nothing separate me from him. Nothing, nobody. And that's very true. Nothing or nobody else can. But we have to ask ourselves, what about us though? Can we separate ourselves from the most high? You better believe we can. We sure can. Do you have something? Well, I was just going to say it's talking about God's love. It's not talking about our salvation, though. Thank you. That's what that scripture is talking about. Thank you. Thank you. If you all hear that, I hope you all heard, heard that. This scripture is actually talking about his love. Nothing can separate us from the Most High. Nothing at all. Nobody. Okay? All right. So he is talking about his love. When you go back and read the whole thing, you'll realize that he is talking about his love. All right? 
So let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, let's look at another one. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians what? Chapter 15. Are you reading the whole chapter? Or are you going to start reading this? Uh, I think we're probably going to wind up reading the, the whole chapter. Okay. I'll take the first section. Okay. The reason why I'm reading this is I want to make sure we get the full understanding of what these uh, verses are talking about. But brothers, I make known to you the good news, which I bought as good news to you, which you also did receive and in which you stand, through which also you are being saved through the good news. If you hold fast to the word, which I brought as good news to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Okay, let's let the word talk. Verse 2, through which also you are being saved, if you hold fast that word I bought, you as, bought as good news to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. That's why I wanted to read the whole chapter, because it's going to talk about the corrupted and incorruptible. I want to make sure we understand, if. You hold fast to the words that I bought as good news to you. Otherwise, you have belief in vain. Whoever has uh, Webster's on your, um, on your uh, phone, look up the word if for me. Verse 3. For I delivered to you at the first that which I also received, that Messiah died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Kepha, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brothers at one time, of whom the greater part remain till now, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by Jacob, or uh, James, then by all the emissaries, and last of all, he was seen by me also as if to one born prematurely. For I am the least of the emissaries who am not worthy to be called emissary because I persecuted the assembly of Elohim. But by the favor of Elohim, I am what I am. And his favor towards me was not in vain, but I labored much more than they all, yet not I, but the favor of Elohim with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you believe. And if Messiah is proclaimed that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That was a belief among some, some of the Jews back then. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Messiah has not been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, then our, pro our proclaiming is empty and your belief also empty. And we are also found false witnesses of Elohim because we have witnessed of Elohim that he raised up Messiah whom he, he did not raise up. If then the dead are not raised for if the dead are not raised then neither Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, your belief is to no purpose. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. If any of this life, only we have expectation in Messiah. We are, we are of all men the most wretched, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For all, as all die in Adam, so also all shall be made alive in Messiah. 
for each in his own order, Messiah, the first fruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming. Then the end, when he delivers up the reign to Elohim, the father, when he has brought to not all rule and all authority and all power, for he has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to naught is death, for he has put all under his feet. But when he says all are put under him, it is clear that he who puts all under him is accepted. And when all are made subject to him, then the son himself shall also be made subject to him who put all under him in order the Elohim be all in all. So in the kingdom, when the kingdom comes here on earth, a thousand year reign, after that thousand year reign is up, guess what? Guess what Messiah is going to do? He's going to give it to the most high. All that he subdued and put under his feet in the reign here on this earth, he's going to return that power back to Yah. That's, that's what he says. Uh, verse 29. Otherwise, what shall they do who are immersed for the dead if the dead are not, Im, are not raised at all? Why indeed are they immersed for the dead? And why do we stand in danger every hour? I, am affir I'm aff I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Messiah, Yahusha, our master. I die day by day. If a man, if, if as men do I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, of what good is it to me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do, do not be led astray. Evil company corrupts good habits. Wake up to soberness righteously and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of Elohim. I speak this to your shame, but someone might say, how are you dead? How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Senseless one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And as to what you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain. It might be wheat or some other grain, but Elohim gives it a body as he wishes and each seed a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of fishes and another of birds. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the esteem of the heavenly is true is truly one, and the esteem of the earthly is another. Anybody else want to pick up? Start at 41. Oh, no, you go ahead. Okay, pay attention to verse 50 and, and those verses in that area. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just, I'll just, uh, verse 41. 41. Uh, one esteem of the sun, and another esteem of the moon, and another esteem of the stars. For the stars differ from stars in esteem, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is, its, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It okay. is sown... Keep going. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the verses that, that's used, raised in, in corruption. But that's talking about after our bodies die. Go ahead. Okay, then that's when we are raised in incorruption. Uh, it is sown in disrespect, it is raised in esteem, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it has been written, the first man Adam became a living being, and the last Adam a life-giving spirit. The spiritual, however, was not the first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual, the first man was of the earth, earthly, and the second man is of the master from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are. So sorry, as is in as is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. And as 
is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born the likeness of the earthly, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. Just that real quick, sorry. Um, and this is what, in this I say, brothers, that the flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. See, I speak a secret to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for this trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this uh, corruptible, for this corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality. And when this incorruptible has put on incorruption, sorry, and when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to be the, the word that has been written. Death is swallowed up in, in overcoming. I can't read today. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, she Sheol, where is your overcoming? And the sting of death is the sin, and the power of the sin is the Torah. But thanks to Elohim who gives us the overcoming through our Messiah, Yahusha. Therefore, my beloved brothers, we set fast and be set fast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Master, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Hallelujah. All right, so we know that we are in the the corruptible right now. Okay? Only after we die are we incorruptible. Okay? So while we're here, we're in our flesh bodies that we are in right now, it is possible we are not possible, we are corruptible. That's where we're going from incorruptible when we die and we get our new bodies, we will be incorruptible, we will live forever just like we were supposed to have when Adam had had his pretty much an incorruptible body. Um, so just be, be very careful. When I wanted to make sure that we read all of this from beginning to the end, okay? When we will be transformed into incorruptible beings once we leave these corruptible bodies, okay? I know it seems like... Uh, a minor thing to talk about, but this is also again one of the um, one of the scriptures that is used. So I want to make sure that we read them. Also, let's go to John ten and verse twenty eight. John ten verse twenty eight. I'm really trying to watch what I say because I want to make sure that it's the word that is talking and that it is not me talking. So I'm, I'm really watching what I say. And then when we get further on in, maybe I'll talk a little more. But I think right now we need to let the word of Yah do the talking. John 10 in verse 28. Let's go ahead and read um, a, a little bit before that. Okay, in 28. Um, let's go ahead and read and start reading in verse 24. So the Yehudim sounded, surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, say to us plainly. And Yahusha answered them, I have told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name. They bear witness concerning me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they know me, and I give them everlasting life, and they shall by no means ever perish, and no one shall ever snatch them out of my hands. Okay, this is a foundational scripture right there from the Calvinism, and I'll, let me speak on that for a second. In verse 28, I give them everlasting life. Okay. When do we get everlasting life? Okay, when? Do we there you go. Do we have everlasting life at this second? Can we die? Yes. 
okay, and until he comes, are we going to die? Just what our body, that's what an incorruptible body does. An incorruptible body dies. But until we become... Incorruptible body. Well, yeah, a corruptible body. A corruptible body does die. Okay? So we have to be very careful. People would like to use this as, okay, now I have everlasting life. Well, you have everlasting life after you've been raised. You have everlasting life. So I just want to make sure that we watch some of these things that are said that we have to be very careful in how, how people say them. Okay, so, and I give them everlasting life, and they shall by no means ever perish. Okay, are we in perishable bodies at this time? Yes, yes we are. We, our bodies perish. The older we get, the more cricking starts happening. The more cracking starts happening. The more backs start going out and everything else. So we are in a perishable body at this time, but we will move to an imperishable, imperishable body. Okay. All right. Let's continue. And they shall by no means ever perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hands. This is from the studying that I've been looking at and all the reading and from since I've come into the truth. Um, my wife will tell you, my wife actually, I think we've talked about this before. My wife actually stopped me on a train with a pastor. This was when I was in the church and this pastor was talking about, um, you know, once we're saved, we're always saved. And I said to him, I was like, once we're saved, we're always saved. I said, that's, that, that's not true. He says, oh, yes, it is. He says, think of it like this. Yah, he says, God has his hand and he puts you inside and he locks you in and nobody can take, take you out of his hand. He's got you. No, Satan can't do anything. Nobody can take you out of his hand. And I said to him, yeah, but what if you're inside? You can actually move his hand, his finger, and walk out by your own choice. Yeah, nobody can take you from Yah, from Yah. Nobody can snatch you from Yah. But your own decision to no longer be obedient to Yah, not that you um, try to do obedience and make it your works, but you can, you can walk away from Yah. It's kind of like a locked door, like you can... Yeah, nobody can get in, nobody can get in to, to hurt you. Go right to it and open up the door. And so my wife, we was on a train ride, and uh, she asked me, she said, she tapped me on the leg and said, sweetie, not here, not here. And I, I was in the ministry full time too, but I was like, you're not going to tell me that I, I couldn't walk away, from, walk away from him. You know, I mean, everybody has that choice. And that, when you say that statement, everybody has their choice, then the whole comment of, well, then they must not have been a real Christian. That's when that comes into play. Well, if they walk away, then they weren't truly a real Christian. Well, let's keep reading scripture to find out whether somebody can really be in belief and then walk away because there are warnings. There are more warnings about losing your belief, then we can shake a stick at. And that's why I said we won't be able to get through all of them today. But for the sake of those who um, hold to the once saved, always saved doctrine, I wanted to read those scripture and be able to put those out front for everybody to hear because somebody may read that and be like, hey, well, that's that's what I, I, I'm not here to dissuade nobody. I'm here to present the facts to you and show you what the scriptures say. And you got to make your own decision. I'll never make anybody, I can't make anybody believe anything. You have to take what the words of the Most High say and dissect it and read it. And then you have to let the Ruach speak to you. So let's keep going. We'll do, uh, we'll do another one. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8 and 9. There's something I read in Joshua. It was talking about uh, it said that Yah has no need for sinners. It says he sets righteousness in, uh, in wizards. But I forgot how, how it worded it, but it said he says righteousness 
and everything before you. He said, it's up to you to, to put out your hand to which one you want. Mm -hmm. It's like, Yah's not going to make you fall because he has no need for a sinner. Mm -hmm. But Yah's going to let you do what you want to do because he's giving you a choice to either follow him or don't follow him. He's not going to like, oh, I'm going to make you follow me because I'm going to do this what mm -hmm. you do. He's, everybody has a choice. Yeah, of course. Ephesians 1. But, two. Ephesians 2. Think about it. Think about Adam and Hawa. Did they not have a choice? I mean, they were living perfection. Man, they could commu probably communicate with the animals. They probably got to see messengers walking around, flying around in the garden, moving around. They saw everything. And they and Yah told them, you can eat of all the fruit that you want. Eat from every tree, but this tree you do not touch. Did anybody make them eat of the forbidden fruit? Yeah. He, was a, he, he, was a, he was a good angel, and now he's going to hell. He, he, exactly. He was in heaven. He was, he was handmade by the Most High, and oh. even he turned away. So again, the whole once saved, always saved doctrine was not around until a man bought that doctrine out. So when you start following that doctrine, you're following what that man has made. We know what the word says, but when people are putting groups of scriptures together to make it say what they wanted to say, then you become a follower of that man. That's why uh, people are called Calvinists. Now, some of them fight and don't want to be called that, but, but, but it is. And you have synergists. I've never heard of synergists. It's almost the same thing. So... Um, you, you just have to be very careful when it comes when it comes to reading Yah's word. So let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 9. Anybody want to read that? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Elohim, not of works, lest any man should boast. Go ahead, read verse 10 too. I'm sorry. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah and unto good works, which Elohim has before ordained that we should walk in them. Mm. Mm. That's deep. That's deep. The verse, this is the parts that I love. It is not by works. So that no one should boast. Don't think because you you keeping all the commandments that you that you say that ain't never worked by keeping just the commandments by themselves are, has never worked. Never worked. Why? Because our wretched sin. Okay, so that's why you have belief and works just like James. You can't tell me. You can't tell the Most High. Let's, let's say, you can't tell the most high that you love them and go out here and live like the sons of Satan live. That, that doesn't fly. It doesn't work. You can't do that. You can't tell them you love them. I'm yours. I'm going to enter the kingdom and you're out here living like one of the sons of hell. It, it, it can't happen. Okay? So think about how what the most high or how uh, the most high feels. You take... If your son comes to you and tells you that he loves you and you've already given him a standard which he is to live by, because that in itself right there proves that you love me and you choose not to live according to the way that you live or that he's told us to live. You choose to live a way that is contrary. Which one shows love to the father, the way and he tells you in which to live or living contrary to tell how he tells you to live? Which one? The way in which he tells you to live. That's how you show your love. It's not works. Verse 10. For, for we are his workmanship created in Messiah, Yahusha, unto good, unto good works. Let me preface it. Unto good works, which Elohim prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What is the walking in them? the good works but he's telling you don't do don't think you're going to do works and that gets you in it doesn't 
But once we come into belief, we are created. We're craftsmen. He made us to walk out that workmanship. That's what he's saying. Nothing more, nothing less. So let's be very careful in how we say things. Let's be very careful in the scripture that we use to justify someone um, uh, thinking that they can live the way they want to live after they come into the belief, because that's not so. Check uh, YouTube. Your screen is froze. Somebody, yeah, if somebody else don't mind checking, it's yeah, right. he's done it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna upload the the regular to to the YouTube anyway, just in case. I just hate that the people who are on there. I have that definition for if that you said. Okay, go ahead with the definition of if. It is used as the sign of a condition, or it introduces a conditional sense. Uh, and at the bottom it says whether or not. Okay, used as a sign of condition. If you keep my commandments. If, that means either you can keep them, or either you're not going to keep them. It says, if there is a condition as to whether you obtain salvation, if, 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 and I'm going to, we'll show all the scriptures that go along with that. So if is a, is a really big word. It is conditional. All right. So let's go ahead and start moving into some of the, some of the, the verses that the scriptures talk about. There's a lot more um, if you want to go back and read there, the Calvinist supporting scriptures, you can read Psalms 135, verse 6, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 through 35, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 through 11, all good verses. There ain't no such thing as a bad verse. John chapter 6, verse 37 through 36. Uh, let's do that one. John chapter 6, verse 37 through 39. The audio is working on YouTube, but it's... it's, it's the screen is froze? Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like, uh, 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 it looks like a while ago there were some people that were off, so that's why I was trying to make sure. Um, those of you who are listening, I'm sorry it froze up, uh, on YouTube. Like I said, I will upload it. Okay, we're going to read John chapter 6. 37 through 39. And I, and I have to read this one. Because this is one of the, the primary uh, verses that, that is used as well. For the once saved, always saved um, doctrine. But I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me, I shall by no means cast out. Listen, all those who come to him, he's not going to look at you and say, ah, you can't be in. Boop. He shall by no means cast out. Because I have come down out of the heaven not to do my own desire, but the desire of him who sent me. This is the desire of the father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should not lose one of it, but should raise it in the last day. He says, all that the father has given him, he shall not lose one of it. That means Satan can't take them away from them. Satan can't just come up and go, I, I got them now. Y'all's going to protect you. Nothing can take you away from him. Now, again, this is where the, then they really truly never were a Christian comes in. Because if I say, well, yeah, they, nobody can take you, take us away from him, but I mean, if I choose to go by my flesh and not live according to his word, I can walk away from him. Then that means that you truly never was um, a Christian. I mean, those are the things that we hear. 
So that's why that particular doctrine comes in. And I call that, this is literally what it's called. Um, uh, let's see. False or true Christian. That's where that belief, the or, originate, this originates the belief of a false or true Christian. That means that if, the, that doctrine means that if you fall away from the most high, you were never really his. So do we have some supernatural thought that we know that we have the mind of the most high? I mean, how do I know it's, I'm not one? How, how do we as humans say that person never really was a believer in the truth? How do we do? How do we be the judge of that? Oh, well, they never really was one. How do we know that they did not get tempted? And how do we know that they just got tired of being righteous and wanted to live by their flesh? But how do we make that judgment? That's for Yah to make that judgment, not us. Any, anybody have anything? You have anything, baby? Okay. All right. Now let's start moving through some of the some of the scriptures that that we know that um, kind of counters the once saved always saved doctrine because there's just so many of them. There's no way after reading them all that a person can say, "I still believe once saved." I pray Jesus into my heart, and so therefore I'm going to heaven. It don't matter what I do. It don't matter if I turn away from Him because I prayed Him into my heart. I'm going to heaven regardless. That don't make sense. That doesn't make common sense. Okay, so let's go ahead and start going through a lot. And we're going to move kind of fast because we've got a, a, a lot to go through. And matter of fact, what we'll do is I want to start out with what the Messiah says first. Because that's what's most important is what Messiah says. Not, not, not Paul. I I don't have nothing against Brother Paul. Brother Paul, I love Brother Paul. People got Brother Paul twisted. There's a lot of people that they don't like Paul. I like Paul. If you understand what he's really saying. So John, all them, hey, love them all. Thank you, elder brothers who brought the truth to us and gave us the word. But let's go see what the Messiah says first. Because really, all we got to do is read one scripture. We can shut the book and go home, actually. Okay. Let's start off uh, John chapter 15. Since we're in John, let's do John chapter 15, verse 5 and verse 6. And anybody can read that. John chapter 15, verse 5 through verse 6. Go ahead. All right. I, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, because without me you are able to do not. If anyone does not stay in me, he is thrown away as a branch dries as a branch and dries up. And they gather him and, and throw him into the fire, and they are burned. Shut the book, we done. Let's go home. And why do I say that? It's evident what the Messiah says. It's evident what he's saying to us. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now, let's get an example of this. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. We, we got to hit Romans chapter 11. And let's verify this. And I always like to use Israel as an example. Romans Chapter 11. Remember, he said he's the what? The and we are the what? The We're the branches. Okay, well, let's, let's go to Romans chapter 11 and see if what it says. Um, let, let's start at verse 18 and let's read through 22. Anybody want to read? boast against the branches and if you boast remember you do not bear the root but the root bears you mm -hmm. you shall say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in good but 
I'm sorry, by unbelief they were broken off. Okay, stop. Why were the branches broken off? Unbelief. 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 Who was he talking to? Who was he talking about? Israel. Israel. They were people who he had chose personally. They were in belief. Why? Because he saved them out of Egypt, brought them out, showed them the signs. They went back into the land. They lived all those years. And then they came into unbelief. And what did he say about the branches? That they were what? Grafted. No, oh, they, were, off. they were broken off. So that means they were a part of it at one time. At one time. They got cut off. And then they got, this is, new, this is New Testament scripture. This is a nation of people, Israel, who was in belief. And then he broke them off. He broke off the branches. Okay, keep going. Uh, 21. Thank you. Um, for if, okay, let me read 20. Good, by unbelief they were broken off and you stand by belief. Do not be arrogant, but fear. For if Yahuwah did not spare the natural branches, he might not spare you either. Okay. He just told the Gentiles, I broke off the natural branches, Israel. Don't be arrogant in your belief because I can break you off too. Does that, is that once saved, always saved? Isn't that once saved, always saved? No, that means... You save now, but if you keep up in your arguments, I'm going to break you off and you won't be saved. It's, it's that simple. We cannot go after doctrines of men. We have to be very careful. He says, don't be deceived. Don't come out of your way or don't go. Don't walk away from the way. Don't be deceived by anybody. We're going to read that too. Okay, now let's go back to John. And let's let's finish that one up. That? John 15, 5 and 6. Read read both of those again. Oh. Okay. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who stays in me and and I in him, he bears much fruit. Because without me you are able to do not. If anyone does not stay in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So the Messiah says, if, the conditional word, remember, if anyone does not stay, okay, in order for you to stay somewhere, where do you have to be? There. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. In order for you to stay, you got to be there. Can we close the book? It's a done deal. This is Messiah speaking. He's already told us that we can lose. We can lose it. We can lose our salvation. We can no longer be saved. That's the whole purpose of the scripture, that he that endures until the end. Well, it's just like, if your father asks you to do a job and he says, I'll pay you if you do this job, but if you don't do it, you don't get paid. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, you can, you, you can, you don't have to do it, but you won't get paid. You know, you won't get a reward for it. So you have to continue doing something in order to get your reward for doing it. Right. You can't be, you can't, you can't start doing it and then stop doing it and still expect to get paid because you may have started it, but you still stopped. Mm -hmm. So therefore you lost it. It's, it's, it's simple and easy to understand. It's just the doctrine of men who mess things up. Uh, let's go to Luke 8 and verse 13. We'll, stay, we'll try to stay in the close areas because we're right here anyway by where Messiah is speaking. Luke 8 and verse 13. Somebody can read that so we can make sure that we, we get through a lot of these. I'm, we're going to go through a lot of them. Okay, go ahead. Whoever wants to read it. They on the rock are they, which, which when they hear, it, can, see the you know what? Can can we go ahead and start at eleven? Because okay. that that's not a good spot. All spot. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead and start at eleven. Okay. I'll tell you when to stop. Now the problem is this: the seed is the word of Elohim. Those by the wayside are they that hear. It. Then cometh the devil 
and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they, which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Okay, let me read this version. And those on the rock are those, when they hear, receive the word. They receive it, the word with joy. And these have no root who believe for a while and in time. He says that they believe and they believe for a while. So they're in belief. Okay. They believe for a while and in time of trial fall away. The Messiah says fall away. This once Saved, always saved doctrine. We have to be very careful that man does not create doctrine to cause us to be deceived in thinking I'm in, I'm there, I'm, I'm hook, line, and sinker. Ain't nothing going to ever keep me from going to heaven. telling you y'all we got to be careful of that yeah and let's let me let's keep reading let's read 14 also is that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection mm. boy I mean, we don't have to say nothing else. The, the word does it. He do 15. But that on the good, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. I'm going to read from this one. And, and that on the good soil are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, retain it and bear fruit with endurance. So you have those where they hear the word, but Satan snatches it up. You have those that begin to grow, but they receive the word and they have the belief, but because they have no root, they begin to grow and then they die. And then you have those who are thrown on the rocky place. Those are different types of people in belief and they fall away. They are no longer in belief. So again, the once saved, always saved doctrine, when you compare it to what the Messiah says, it's not true. It's not true. Okay, let's go to, yes ma'am. I was just going to say, but um, on 15, where it says, and that on good soil are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, retain it and bear fruit with endurance. There's that Endure. enduring. Yes, end, yes, yes, yes. Keep it. Thank you and for you, bringing that up. Yes. So that's that, uh, those people who are staying in to believe with the word. Mm hmm are enduring. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, as you see, you can't make this up. Scripture defines Scripture. When man tries to define scripture, that is when confusion comes in. And that's why this whole doctrine is a confusing doctrine because it was started by a man. Justification by faith alone is what the doctrine was called. Okay, so let's be very, very careful. How can you have a doctrine that goes against what even our Messiah says? If that happens, you know it doesn't originate from him. Let's keep going. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter. Uh, we're already doing Luke 8, aren't we? Let's go to Matthew 24, verse 44 through 51. I'm sorry, what? Matthew 24, 44 through 51. And for those of you who are wanting to hear Hebrews, we're going to get that too. Uh-huh. 44 through 
51. Anybody want to read that? I can read it. It says 44. 44 through 51. Okay. Because of this, be ready too. For the son of Adam is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is a trustworthy and wise servant whom his master set over his household to give them food in season? Blessed is that servant whom his master having come shall find doing. Truly I say to you that he shall set him over all his possessions. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and it begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with, with the drunkards and the, ma the master of that servant shall come on a day when he does not expect it and at an hour he does not know. And, that, and he shall cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hey, was he not a servant? Did the master not trust this man enough to set him over his household? If he hadn't trusted him, he never would have put him over his household to watch over his vineyard, to watch over the people who were, who were there doing the work, right? But because the master didn't come home, he was like, hey, I'm going I'm to I'm live this up. And had the master known that he would have done that, he never would have put him there in that position no way. But because that servant became wicked, it says that when he comes back, he'll cut that servant up in two. And he's going to send them out with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a metaphor for hell. For punishment. Okay? So you have a servant. He turns wicked. He gets cast out. All right? That does not sound like that servant was saved and he's always saved. If we go by that doctrine alone, then that means the master would have come home, saw what the servant did, and the master would have looked at him and said, it's okay. There'd be no punishment for it. Right? So we can close up the scripture and we can go home. That kind of, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. That, that kind of plays into something that Mr. Eric had said on one of his lessons the other day. He said, uh, how, does a, how does the employer know that, it, know that he has a good employee? And one of the women up there says, by his works. And he said, so if, the, if, if an employer sees that his, that his employee is, is doing good works, he said, now, if you have a, an employee that's, he said, how do you know that you don't have an a good employee? Because they're not doing what they're supposed to. He's saying, mm -hmm. so so that so that when that uh, bad employee isn't doing what they're supposed to, and they keep doing what they're not supposed to, mm -hmm. the employer will fire them. He said, so cannot y'all fire you if yeah. you're not doing what you're supposed See? to do? He can cast you out. Yes, sir. 100%. It's a doctrine of demons. I hate I hate to say that. And I say that not to offend, but it's against y'all. You, you, you're based, this doctrine, Mr. Calvin, you have basically given people the go-ahead to live how they want to live. That's what you've done. You have given people the right to say, well, I pray Jesus into my heart. I'm going into the kingdom. Man, I'm going to go out here and live it up because it doesn't matter now because I'm done. Now, even if you don't have the heart of that, like, okay, well, I pray Jesus into my heart and, you know, you try to... Uh, you know, you try to do what is right, but if you weren't keeping his word and living according to his word, not what's right in, you think is right in your heart, but according to the word, then you, you fall in. It doesn't motivate you to obey either. No, it don't when motivate you, you to you, obey. When you uh, do the praying Jesus into your heart, it doesn't because then you're like, well, what's the point of obeying? I mean, I've already got my my, my reward. Ticket in, yeah. So there's no point in doing anything else. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, John three and thirty six. John three thirty six. Let's see if we can scat through quite a bit of these. John three and thirty six. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start at verse 31. John chapter 3, 31 to 36. He who comes from above is over all. He who is from the earth is of the earth and speaks of the earth. 
He who comes from the heaven is over all. And, he, and what he has seen and heard, that he witnesses. And no one receives his witness. He who receives his witness has set his seal that Elohim is true. For he whom Elohim has sent speaks the word of Elohim. For Elohim does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all into his hands. He who believes in the son possesses everlasting life. But he who does not obey the son shall not see life. But the wrath of Elohim remains on him. He who believes in the son possesses everlasting life. But he who does not obey. See, you can believe but not obey. See, the church teaches that you don't have to do the commandments. You don't have to obey the word like that. You don't have to keep do the older covenant if you understand what laws I'm talking about. But it's saying here, you have to believe and you, you got to obey. You can't do one or the other. You have to do them both together. So let me say it like this. It's not that you do works in order to make it into the kingdom. You do works because you're grateful because he has given you the opportunity to enter the kingdom. So because you've, you're receiving that saving salvation, you do the works that go along with that out of gratefulness. Not that you're compelled or made or forced to do it. Your heart is so grateful, you do it anyway. You do it because you want to do it because you know that's what he wants. Okay? Have to be careful of the doctrines of demons. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. Can we also read the definition for, for works, for doing? Go ahead. At some point. Why don't you read that? Yeah. Have you got it up? Yeah, I have it up. Okay, read that before we go on. Uh, the definition for works or for doing means to practice, to perform repeatedly or habitually, um, by implication to execute, to accomplish. Um, it says uh, to commit, deed, do, exact, keep, require, use arts. And that's works. Right. So it means to basically repeat it habitually. Don't just do it one time, but just keep practicing it and performing. That's called a life of righteousness. If your works are set according to Yah, that's called righteousness. Now, if you do your works according to your job, that's works. But when it's done according to Yah and his word, and his works, that's righteousness. Okay? Uh, let's say Matthew 6, 15. Of course, you know we're going to go before and below. Anybody want to read 14 through 16? I'll read it. Go ahead. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father shall also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither shall your Father forgive your trespasses. Keep going. Yes, yeah, 16. Okay. And when you fast, do not be sad-faced like hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces so that they appear to be fasting to men. Truly, I say to you, they have their, re their reward. Okay. But if you do not forgive me, if, there's that word again, conditional. But if you do not forgive me in their trespasses, neither shall your father forgive you your trespasses. So, very, very serious verse here. If you don't forgive your brother or sister... And you go stand before Yah, neither you. That, that's a very serious verse. Okay? All right. Let's read. Uh... <laughs> you know, we really should read this. Uh, let's read the, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Let's watch the example in this. Matthew 18 and 35. I mean, we can just flip every page pretty much and find, find all this. Matthew 18, what? Matthew 18 and 30. And, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to, um, 
read this uh, starting in verse 23. Okay, I'm going to read this just for, I, I want to read this. That's why I'm going to read it. <laughs> okay, Be, listen to this, y'all. Forgiveness and revoking. I want them two words to be in your head when we read this. Forgiveness and forgiveness being revoked. Because of, the, of this, the reign of the heavens is like a certain man, a sovereign who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was unable to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all he had and payment to be made. Then the servant fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I shall pay you all. And the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. That means he had the debt no more. And the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. Then his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I shall pay you all. But he would not and went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that he had, had taken place. Then his master called him and said to him, wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt seeing you begged me. Should you also have compassion on your fellow servant as I also had compassion on you? And his master was wroth and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So also my heavenly father shall do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So here we have the king forgiving the debtor. He forgave them and sent him on his way. It was a done deal. He goes out and says, I'm going to lay hands on you. And he does not absolve the person who owed him their debt. Instead, he lays hands on them, has them thrown into prison. And the king brings him back and puts him in the prison and tortures him. That was a servant who was forgiven and their forgiveness was revoked. Let's close the book up and let's go home. These are examples that Messiah gives. Can the once saved doctrine always save or justification by faith alone hold anything to this parable that we just read? No. No, it can't. Once saved, always saved, does not come from Yah. It comes from man's doctrine. All right? Let's go on to some more Messiah. Let's look at, uh, well, let's go to James. James 5, 19 through 20. James 5, 19 through 20. Now, this is from James, an apostle, one who knew the master, one who walked with the master. He knows what the master means. He knows what the master says. The master imparted truth to them and opened up their eyes before he left. Okay, so let's look and see what it says. Anybody want to read that? 
James 5, 19 to 20. Okay, I can read it. Go ahead. Brothers, if anyone among you goes astray from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he that he who turns a sinner from the straying of his way shall save shall save a life from death and cover a great number of sins. Okay. If anyone among you goes astray from the truth, remember the word astray. Let me read the definition for astray. Out of the right way or proper place. So if anybody goes out of the right way or the proper place, we know exactly what that means. If anyone among you goes astray from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from from the straying of his way shall save a life from beneath from death and cover a great multitude of sins okay so you can stray from the truth and be lost all right um we will pick back up on this next week because i want to read all of the verses that the bible has to read in regards to um, the once saved, always saved doctrine. And uh, I think, again, it's very important for everybody to go back over those scriptures. And for those of you who do believe in the once saved, always saved doctrine, um, read exactly what the Messiah is saying. Um, and you will see that you can, you can lose your salvation by you, not anybody else. Nobody else can take you away from Yah. Nobody. No, not Satan. Nobody, but remember the verse that talks about Satan being the roaring lion, looking to see who he can destroy. He's not talking about the people who are out doing what they want to do. He's not caring about destroying them. They're already destroyed. He's talking about those who are in belief. He's looking to see how he can destroy them. Why? Because he's mad at Yah and he's against Yah. He's after Yah's people, okay? So if you're once saved, always saved, what's the point in Satan being a lion going around searching for those whom he can destroy? They're already going to make it in. What good is it going to be for you to try to snatch them away? Okay, so again, be careful of the doctrine of men. I'm sorry that I'm playing low today, but I want to make sure it's the word that is actually doing the speaking and that you're getting understanding from the word. So next week, we will pick up with part two, and we will finish up the rest of the scriptures from Paul, from John, uh, from Peter. We'll look at all of those scriptures. And I will, through this week, be posting stuff up on Facebook in regards to once saved, always saved um, doctrine, because um, it's very important, and it, it needs to be talked about and discussed. So thank you all for tuning in. Those of you who are um, on YouTube, YouTube, YouTube already shut off. I guess your phone died. I will be uploading this video up on to YouTube, and um, uh, that way we will have it there as well. And it will also be on the Yoshia Edward Logan um, page as well, or YouTube as well. So look forward to seeing you all again next week. Um, I hope this has been good. We've went through some scripture. Next week, we will try to get through all of the rest because I want everybody to have all the scriptures regarding the whole once saved, um, always saved doctrine, which is a fallible doctrine um, in and of itself. So look forward to seeing you all next week. Hey, three o'clock on the dot. Um, I try to be timely unless the Ruach says keep going then I'll definitely keep going. But we're timely today. And uh, again, thank you all uh, for joining in. For those of you who want to go back and watch this, it will be uploaded on Facebook. And I will go back to the YouTube later this evening and upload that as well. So you'll be able to take all the verses from it as well. So thank you all for joining in. Shalom, shalom.